Welcome back to another edition of our preseason conference series. My name is Joe DeSalvo with my partner, Mike Bainbridge. And Mike, we've knocked out Conference USA. We've knocked out the AAC. We're getting into the Mountain West Conference. And, you know, unlike the previous two conferences, not a ton of changes, some offensive coordinator changes. Uh, I think just a couple of them in the conference. No teams changing conferences here. So everything seems pretty static compared to to a year ago. Any general thoughts on the Mountain West before we get into talking to some of the teams, uh, college fantasy football-wise? Yeah, I would think maybe not the coaching ranks, but uh, some of the rosters, I think, have changed from from some premium positions in college fantasy. When you look at, you know, Fresno State doesn't have uh, that trio of playmakers that were so valuable in CFF last year. You look at a, a Wyoming running back turnover, Air Force, Brad Roberts no longer there. So some premium positions within this conference that is seeing some roster turnover. Yeah, it's a good point. I think where we were pretty steadfast in some of these players in this conference last year, um, you know, up there pretty high in some of our rankings in the preseason, a lot of question marks going into this season. Now, let's start off with Boise State, right? Because I think you and I both were surprised that running back George Halani came back. We've got Ashton Genty waiting in the wings. Um, I know he was somebody that you were on board with last year. Um, I, we, we've spoken about this too, right? You know, probably the presence of both hurts their fantasy value in 2023 a little bit. Um, if you want to kind of elaborate a little bit, some of our discussions about Halani and Genty and your thoughts uh, going into this season from a fantasy perspective. Yeah, it's frustrating you know, just because, I mean, Ash and Genty would have been a top flight first round draft pick probably if if in CFF, if if George Halani wasn't there. And I'm just shocked. I think you're surprised, too, that Halani didn't parlay his 1000 yard season, you know, into, you know, possibly entering the NFL draft. Not that he's a premium NFL draft pick, but the fact that, you know, this was his probably best season that he's had, made it through mostly uh, fully healthy, and and he decided to come back. I think part of that is Boise State's uh, NIL program has been uh, better of late, so he probably got, you know, a bag here or two to, to return. But, I mean, this causes a lot of, I don't want to say confusion, but it's, 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 it's frustrating from our end in trying to predict what, Boise State's going to do in terms of splitting the carries. Is it going to be 50-50? Is it going to be, you know, 70-30 in favor of Holani? Um, this year, kind of what we saw last year, I mean, you don't really see Boise State kicking Holani to the curb, uh, even if he's not the better player. So um, tough to tough to predict how, how Boise State's going to divvy up the workload, and maybe both will be valuable just because Boise State is going to run so much this year. Yep, best ball format. You recommend handcuffing these guys if you're going to go ahead and jump on one, get the other. I mean, we've we've spoken about this a number of times. We don't wish any ill will or injuries on anybody, but you kind of get the you kind of get the feel, right? This is one of those situations where if one guy were happened to go down for a period of time, the other guys all of a sudden now you're looking at a top 20, maybe top 15 running back, right? Yeah, I I think I would compare it to the G5 version of Michigan. Uh, for example, like Ash and Genty being Donovan Edwards, Corum and Holani, uh, one guy goes down, which we saw last year with Michigan. And then, you know, a guy could assume 25, 30 carries. I think stacking them is the best uh, option, obviously, um, for those two. And I thought it was notable in our recent best ball. Like I had, um, I was on a, I was on the turn and I selected Gen Genty first. And then I could, I waited I think and uh, two rounds, so I got him in I Genty in round ten maybe, and then Holani. I didn't even have to get him with that next pick on the turn. I could I waited till round twelve um, or thirteen to to get him too. So um, you don't have to necessarily stack them right in a row together because I think people might let you have George Holani uh, later on. Yeah, and I think that even not not to not to make things more complicated, but we also don't have an extensive track record or sample size with the new offensive coordinator, right? Bush Hamden. I mean, there's not a lot to suggest we know what we're going to get from him either, right? Yeah, two seasons at Washington as the the offensive coordinator, um, he gave the ball primarily to his running back one. Um, I think his backup 
maybe he had a hundred carries in both seasons, but he, the backup uh, for Washington, those two seasons only averaged 10 points per game. So um, if somebody doesn't, you know, like you said, we don't want ill will upon somebody, but um, if both are healthy for the full season, I mean, somebody might not be as valuable uh, to your roster. Well, shifting focus a little bit from the running game, because we can't ignore quarterback tail and green. He's, he's going to be a, he should be, he does have some fantasy appeal, I should say, right? So let's talk a little bit about him and whether or not we really want to target anybody in that Boise State passing game from a receiver standpoint, because Taylor Green, what he offers and what makes him such an appealing fantasy option is his dual threat ability, not necessarily his ability to just pass the ball, right? Yeah, um, it was it, I was just looking back, it was kind of interesting that Boise State, as they as he grew into the position, Taylor Green, they did start to throw it more as the season went along, but his completion percentage went down. Uh, I think he failed to throw more than a touch one touchdown in in three of the last five starts, four of the last five starts, something like that. So um, he's got some work to do as a passer, but uh, really, when you can run the way that he can, I mean, he he provides immense value with, with his legs. So. Um, you know, I'm, I, I like him as a top 30 quarterback. I think you're about the same uh, range where I'm at. And you maybe have some interest in receivers, uh, but wide receiver one for Boise State average, 7.5 fantasy points per game last year. So I'm, I'm, I'm out on that, uh, on that group. Well, look, transitioning from Boise State to Utah State, let's talk about where there is some value at receiver right now. Utah State coming off of a very down year after winning the conference the year before in 2021. Uh, Terrell Vaughn's kind of, you know, our best buy right now from, from a roster standpoint on, on Utah State. Are we looking at, or, or should fantasy owners, uh, should, other, should fantasy owners be looking at other players or which players for Utah State other than Terrell Vaughn should, should they have on their radar right now? So I'll start with Vaughn quick. Um, yep. we, can, we mentioned it in the guide, just, He's our seventh highest projected receiver. Um, yeah, we both, I think, have him beyond the, the 20th ranked receiver. So um, you spoke about this, I know, on a recent podcast. It's just, you know, there's question marks at quarterback. Um, so that's why we're not as confident as our projection states. Um, I don't think – I think he's going later than he should, too, um, in the double-digit rounds. Um, I don't know if that has to do with his size. I mean, he's only five foot seven, 170 pounds, but just remember a couple of years ago, Devin Tompkins at a similar size, yeah. just smashed as a, as a top five fantasy, fantasy receiver. So I'm not sure why he's going as late as he is. And honestly, I, I can't give you a great reason as to why we're, uh, we're, we're so quote unquote, low on him with our rankings. Um, again, I think it's just the quarterback question marks. You know, we're not, I'm not confident at all in Cooper Lega, um, or Levi Williams, whoever should come out on top in that job. So if they're able to at least do enough to support Terrell Vaughn, I think he should have potentially a, a top 10, top 15 type season. As far as anywhere else to look, I think Robert Briggs is a decent option at running back, smaller, He's re he didn't go uh, he didn't get drafted in our last our last best ball. A uh, little surprising. He wasn't there for the spring, so I think people are kind of just you know not aware of him at, at this point, just because we didn't see any practice reports on him. He was injured, but I mean he was looked upon last year as the kind of the successor for Calvin Tyler. So and Calvin Tyler was a serviceable option. So I think Briggs is an option aside from Terrell Vaughn. Um, Quarterback, I'm kind of staying away unless they run Cooper Lega a little bit more than they did last year. Um, and then we'll see how the rest of the wide receiver room shakes out. Uh, yeah, how do you feel I, about I, this? I, I think really the ability of that offense to be efficient will dictate whether or not there's going to be a second option. With it, whether or not that option, you know, right now we have Kyle Van Leeuwen pegged as wide receiver two right now. But just to kind of circle back on Vaughn and, and kind of put a bow on, on, uh, on him real quick, you know, He's one of those players that I think you and I were surprised at how highly he projected, right? And and a lot of that has to do with historical, you know, context of the offense and the system. 
we don't necessarily can nor can we always project how efficient the quarterback play is going to be in that offense and really when you look at Vaughn and you look at his numbers and you look at his projections I think quite frankly the targets are going to be there this year I think really ultimately what's going to determine his fantasy fate is just how often Utah State can find the end zone in the passing game and I think his ability to score touchdowns this year will ultimately probably make him a top 15, put him inside, finish in the top 15 to 20, as opposed to outside of that, where the true value in him right now would be in the full PPR leagues, because he's probably going to get a ton of targets. He's probably going to catch a ton of balls. Can he find the end zone is ultimately going to be the question I think we're going to be faced with, with Terrell Vaughn. Agree? It's a great point because uh, just five straight uh, years now under Blake Anderson, that the wide receiver one is hit. 100 targets in the season. So speaking to your point, the volume targets going to be there. It's a matter of how many points can Utah State score this year on offense and and how often he can find the end zone. Yep. Now, Mike, another team that struggled last year, uh, year one under a new coach, Colorado State. Let's go there because we had quarterback Clay Millen last year, uh, Colorado State. Uh, you know, quarterbacks under duress is sort of an understatement. Uh, they got, I think they might've led the nation in sacks allowed. Uh, we've got Wharton as one of the top receivers in college fantasy football this year. And I think that's justifiable considering his target share last year. Do we feel like Colorado state's done enough in adding some pieces or gaining some experience in the system to be improved this year so that that offense operates with a little bit more efficiency? They tried. I mean, offensive line, I think seven freshmen, if I remember correctly, yep. <laughs> seven freshmen brought in on the offensive line uh, in their recruiting class, uh, four transfers brought in along the offensive line. So uh, you know, and for, as far as continuity, probably not, but when you hit, when you were so bad along the offensive line, as the Colorado state was, you need turnover. You're not bringing back the same guys. Yeah. Um, cause just because they were, they were so bad last year. So, um, they tried, they brought in a huge recruiting class, multi, uh, several transfers. So, uh, I like, I like Clay Millen. I mean, the stats kind of paint a better picture than maybe how he played, you know, 72% completion rate. Um, you know, it was first, I think, in the Mountain West in efficiency or passer rating. I'm sorry. Uh, so he, he was good at times. Um, needs to push the ball downfield a little bit more. Should be able to do that. Better offensive line, hopefully. Horton, Justice, uh, Ross Simmons is another deep threat. Um, so I think the pieces are there. Um, I'm still kind of taking a hesitant approach uh, with, with kind of this offense um, aside from Horton. Yeah. I think we're both there right now because he's not a dual threat quarterback. He's going to have to throw the ball around the yard. They're going to have to score a lot of points to really justify a high ranking. Now, as far as some of the position players, right? Colorado state did make some improvements. What they brought in Dylan Goffney at receiver, Dallin Hulker, the tight end from BYU. We even have Kobe Johnson projected at running back one for, for Colorado State this year. So they have done their part, at least through the portal, to add some more pieces to this offense to be able to, uh, you know, make it more productive. Ultimately, it's going to come down to some of that blocking in front of um, of Millen to give him some time. But the pieces, look, they seem like they're doing the job as far as getting some players there. Now it's about putting the pieces together, building that continuity, build, building that chemistry and really increasing production, whether or not that's going to happen this year in full, I'm not sure, but I'm with you. I'm a little bit more, I, I'm, I'm lukewarm on Clay Millen, but I don't know what's there not to like uh, with Tory Horton and, and maybe even some of these other pieces in the passing game, if that offense can be a little bit more efficient this year. Yeah, I yeah, similar to you. I, I I like what they have at the skill positions. You know, running back, they brought in a couple of transfers. We have no idea the status of, of Avery Morrow, who was suspended during the spring. Uh, I'm just trying to look it up, and I don't think I'm going to find it. I think it took like two years at Nevada before Jay Norvell really got it clicking yeah. with Carson Strong. I, I know we talked about it last year, right, where it, there was kind of a, a – a, a, period of time or the first year where, where it was started slowly, but I think it was two years that it really, 
you needed to get a click in with Carson Strong and all those pieces at Nevada. So, um, you know, we'll see. We like the. Yeah, we like I, I the talked talent. about it on. I talked about it on another podcast that I was on with Vernon the Redshirt with 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 Katz and and Kay. Right. It, I've never really been one to jump on new systems in new places. Uh, I was not on Nevada. I'm Colorado State last year, and I did even mention. Uh, Western Kentucky a couple of years ago, I think ruined it for a lot of guys and really put it in their head that like these systems are just transferable to no matter where they go. And I think just that was sort of the anomaly in the in sort of the system. And it does take a little time. And it took some time for Norvell to get things going when he was at Nevada as well. But, um, you know, to that point, you know, deep FBS leagues, you could do worse than Clay Millen as your third or fourth quarterback though, right? Yeah, you can get him beyond round 20 too. So he's cheap, so. Yeah, so look, let's go from, uh, uh, you know, that passing offense and hopefully the improvements at Colorado State to uh, a run system. Let's go over to the Academy, Air Force Academy, where they're replacing arguably one of their best fantasy, you know, historical fantasy best best players in, in the program in Brad Roberts, who over the last two years has just been, who was a fantasy monster. Um, talk a little bit about John Lee Eldridge, Mike, and, and what's going on there, because I think some people may be surprised when they see some of the projections on where he's at, maybe where his numbers were compared to where he was at a year ago and a little bit of the transition that they're trying to do with him. Yeah, it's – he's – I think the biggest guarantee that, okay, maybe not the biggest, but one of the bigger guarantees that I could probably make this year is that John Lee Eldridge will not see Brad Roberts type workload of 300 carries in a season. Uh, I, 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 we don't know honestly who else is going to carry the ball for this offense. They still haven't updated their, their 2023 rosters, but we don't really, really don't have a good idea. Even at quarterback, we don't have a great idea of who's going to carry the football this season for Air Force, aside from John Lee Eldridge, but he is not the type of, you know, downhill bruising back that that Brad Roberts was that can take on that type of workload. Not to diminish how how you know talented John Lee Eldridge is, he's got four four speed. Um, you know, I think he's going to, um, you know, he worked out a little bit in the spring, and I think this is the biggest. Um, I don't know, question that we get, like he worked, at, he auditioned at fullback during the spring. I don't know necessarily that he is going to be the starting fullback, B-back, what have you, for, for Air Force this season. Um, what if he's, you know, Caden Remsburg, you remember that name from a couple of years ago. Caden Remsburg only averaged 12, 13 fantasy points per game in the season that he was like the, the lead running back or slot back. Um, unsure of those official designations, but I don't know. It's interesting. I think he's got the talent, but uh, the carries aren't going to be what no. what Brad Roberts had had these last two years. Yep, I agree. Uh, there's not really much to add to that. There's just a lot of uncertainty right now at Air Force. But it's interesting that we're going to go with Air Force, and I'm going to tee up the next few teams because when we look at Wyoming, we look at New Mexico, San Diego State, Nevada. We're about to run down the list of teams where there's not a ton of fantasy appeal. And if so, it's more so in the running game and more one dimensional uh, fantasy teams here. So let's just kind of go down that list. Um, I'll probably start with the maybe one of the least attractive ones right now from an offensive standpoint in Messias is let's start with San Diego State, where quite honestly, Jalen Maiden might be the best option right now um, that, that we know of in that offense we were spoiled for a long time because San Diego state was one of those teams where you went right to, to figure out who was going to be the running back one the next year. We haven't had that now for a couple of years, at least. And now it's almost like that San Diego state running back uh, from a fantasy standpoint is ancient history, Mike. It feels so long ago, right? Yeah. Ronnie Hillman, Adam Wayma, Donnell Pumphrey, Juwan Washington, even Greg Bell, if you want to consider him, like those are just fantasy studs. And, and like you said, you can pencil the next guy up every single year. And I think that's, I think that's in the past now. Um, I just, I, it's done. I mean, 22% volume share last year, which is just 
that just it, it's you can't even fathom it for a, for a San Diego State running back just from what me and you know from the past decade from them. So um, I think they're going to move at a faster pace with with the Ryan Lindley, the former San Diego State quarterback, now the OC uh, for the Aztecs. They're going to throw it a little bit more, um, which we saw in the second half of last year. And, and that kind of alludes to the point that you made that, you know, Maiden is going to be probably the most sought after fantasy asset for, for the Aztecs this year. Yep. Well, let's go over to New Mexico, right? So we're in a similar situation. Now, the one thing that we do know is that that's one of the teams that that made a change in offensive coordinator, right? They bring over Brian Vincent from UAB. So at least we feel like we kind of know what we're getting in an offensive coordinator here. Do we have the back in place to be a fantasy asset, or do we have that guy yet in that offense, or who potentially could be that guy, Mike, according to what we talk about? Yeah, I'm really curious to see any fall reports on Christian Washington. He's a sophomore, 200-pound uh, running back who we've got pegged as RB1 right now. Uh, he, I haven't seen him selected in any uh, best balls that we've done, and I probably wouldn't advise it in a best ball or even a uh, like a redraft setting. Uh, but Dynasty is appealing just because of the new offensive coordinator, Brian Vincent, that they're bringing over, the former UAB uh, – uh, OC and we know what uh, UAB was trying to do the the last handful of years and they're going to run the football uh, this is a sophomore back he's got good size and and apparently impressed enough to beat out some veterans and, and is now on multiple uh, projected depth charts as the projected starting running back here so I think if you are entering a, a, a dynasty draft this year I think you take a look at him in, in the double digit rounds because you know this is a team that they're going to establish an identity and want to run the ball 60 times a game. And they've had shown it. I mean, you've drafted these guys over the years too, right? The UAB running backs. Yeah. You're going to yeah. potentially get in 200 carries if, if things, you know, kind of flow the right way. Well, speaking of 200 carries and running backs, the potential's there in the Wyoming offense. Will we get that this year? And do we know, do we have that guy pegged right now? We've got Harrison Whaley as, you know, RB1 for Wyoming, uh, you know, former NIU running back there. Um, you know, we, we you know, right now, as you you take an historical, you know, context on the Wyoming offense, uh, that's a that's a good position to have. I don't think we're as high on Whaley this year as we've traditionally been on Wyoming backs. I don't know if last year kind of set us back a little bit. Um, but you know, what, why is the confidence not fully there for us this year going into 2023 with that system and with Whaley? Are we not completely sold? I mean, they do have some depth there at running back. We have Dewan McNeely, who, you know, you know, there are some that may argue that he could end up being running back one at Wyoming, right? So is that a little bit of cause for hesitation in, in um, Harrison Whaley? Yeah. Uh, that and a potential injury because Whaley has dealt with injury issues dating back to NIU uh, and then it, it, it reoccurred uh, this spring I think he had a I think I read he had a small like procedure done um, just to clean up they're not worried about his, his status going into the regular season but again if you had injuries back at NIU and then you're you know missing time during the spring at Wyoming I'm a little concerned there the second part that you kind of alluded to uh, Phil Steele, his magazine just came out. He has McNeely as the current running back. One, I don't know if that's because Whaley sat out during the spring or McNeely was just that impressive to the coaching staff that that he's kind of the lead guy heading into, into fall camp. So um, we, we mentioned it in the guide. I think paying attention to the depth chart is paramount here because Let's be honest. You're not investing in the quarterback. You're not investing in the wide receivers. It's all about the running back situation here. So, you know, if you're if you're interested in drafting Whaley, maybe you handcuff and and draft McNeely at the end of at the end of drafts because you know as you, as we've seen over the years, you want that running back one in the Wyoming system. Yeah. Now let's let's look at you know another team, maybe similar situation. Uh, let's go to Nevada, right where. You know, they had a running back last year that had a tremendous volume share, could catch the ball out of the backfield in, in Tawa. This year they bring in Sean Dollars, right, that they have dollars in from uh, the transfer from Oregon. Uh, you know, 
I kind of like dollars. I feel he's an under the radar play this year. Um, I took him in the latest best ball draft. You know, I just don't know what they have behind him and what they're going to do to really improve that offense this year. That's the one thing that does scare me a little bit, but I feel like the volume share could be there for him this year. What's your feeling on Sean dollars in that Nevada offense? No, you, I saw you take him and I like that pick. Um, you know, that's kind of a consistent thing with this offense. The, the offensive coordinator, um, boy, now his name is escaping me. Derek Sage, something like that. Um, comes from the Chip Kelly tree at UCLA. Yeah. He was a tight ends coach. Um, but we, he comes from the Chip Kelly tree, which we know likes to feed the running back one. Yeah. And they did exactly that last year at Nevada. Toa Tawa got 50% volume share. The difference, I would say, between Tawa and Dollars, not a total hindrance, but he is 23 pounds lighter yeah. um, than Tawa. So maybe that plays a factor and he doesn't get that that massive workload that Tawa did. But like you said, well, they, Tawa, Tawa, did get, yeah, Tawa did get 200 plus carries, but he also caught 41 passes out of the backfield. Right. And so if, you know, if dollars is a little smaller, he's a little bit more electric than Tawa was too. Maybe you make a little bit up on, on some big play potential as opposed to the volume and carries, but we know, you know, if he's going to be the, you know, the, you know, the cemented into that running back one spot, will he get to over 250 touches this year? That's, you know, that's, that's debatable, but there's nothing to suggest that 200 total touches isn't out of the equation in this offense. Not at all. And just, I was looking it up now. Tawa averaged 17.7 fantasy points per game in a half point PPR setting. So that's a guy that's valuable on your roster. The question is kind of the same vein as Terrell Vaughn. How many touchdowns, points, how many times are, yeah. is Nevada going to enter the red zone this year? Plus, not, not a huge, not a huge uh, factor for me, but Brendan Lewis, the Colorado transfer, also comes in he's a runner so you know if they do some read option in the red zone maybe he gets a touchdown or two that that could have gone to shine dollars just playing hypothetical here well let's go over to fresno state and this is an interesting one mike because last year we were looking at jake hayner jordan mims jalen cropper and you could debate that that you know mims and cropper were preseason top 20 in their position and, you know, Hayner was, you can make a case that he was at least in the top 40 to 50 running back of quarterbacks going in the preseason. I only say that, not that 40 or 50 is elite. We have no idea what to expect from Fresno State this year. There's a lot of question marks. And even, even at running back where, you know, we have Malik Sherrod, who we believe is the next man up. I think he was the only running back on the roster besides Mims that had more than 20 carries last year. So I'm not saying that he's definitely going to be the guy. Uh, there's just a lot of unknowns going in there. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit, particularly at receiver, because, you know, we know that that wide receiver one has potential to really uh, has some fantasy appeal in that offense. But man, can do we really have that guy pegged right now? I think so, but I've also been tempering my enthusiasm for, for Josiah Freeman, who you're alluding yep. to as the potential wide receiver one, uh, thanks to Eric Froton and his detective work at the scouting combine. I mean, he interviewed Jake Hayner and said, asked him straight up, who do you think is going to be that next guy up in the wide receiver room? First name out of his mouth is Josiah Freeman. Um, maybe they're friends and he just pumping up his buddy. I don't know, but you know, you got to put some stock into that. Um, I've been trending downwards a little bit on that just because his ADP was starting to really soar, like closer to, to, to you know, 13, 14th, 15th round where I was taking him earlier in the off season and rounds 20 and beyond. So I think I mean, you just, still got Jalen Gill there. You've got Eric Brooks. We've got Tim Greer. I mean, names that we've heard before that does have that, that do have potential, but quite frankly, none of them we can sit here and say 100% for sure that are ready to, you know, break out. No, um, I agree with that. And and I think just when we talked about it, I'm kind of just down. And maybe this is, you know, an easy statement to make. I'm down kind of on Fresno State as a whole just because, yeah. you know, so much turnover on that, that offense. You're only bringing back 35% of your per offensive production from last year. And, you know, I'm not a Mikey Keene fan. Um, you know, question marks at running back, 
major question marks at, at wide receiver as you uh, as we talked about just now. So I don't know. I, I would draft Josiah Freeman first of any Fresno State player, but um, you know this offense as a whole, I think, is going to regress from from the past couple of years. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I, we're going to get into the last. We're going to jump into San Jose State. Uh, it's our last team that we have to run down here in the conference. I I, I think now after talking about these teams, I've I've noticed a, a common theme that I'll kind of wrap things up with. But let's get into San Jose State, right? Because you've got Shevin Cordero coming back at quarterback, right? Coming off of a, of, of a solid year. Elijah Cooks is gone. We assume Justin Lockhart, and this is conversations that you and I have during the preseason, right? When we're putting things together with all of the content, we assume Justin Lockhart's going to be the next man up. But, you know, when you look back to him last year, he had one touchdown reception. I believe it was in the bowl game. So he went all 12 regular season games without a touchdown reception last year, which is quite concerning a little bit, knowing that we're projecting this guy at wide receiver one, but is there a better option in that offense? Now, we also know, and it's interesting because you put out a piece on Twitter about volume share at running backs, and Kyrie Robinson kind of comes back this year. He probably figures to get a ton of touches in that offense. There just doesn't seem to be a lot of value in him right now um, or appeal in, in a lot of the drafts, or at least in some of the drafts that I've been in so far. Um, is it just because more he's a little bit more of a grinder? That offensive line hasn't been terribly efficient, and the value right now just kind of lies in Cordero and whoever the San Jose State wide receiver one is. So, first with Robinson, that's where the volume share statistic can be a little deceiving because this is a pass first offense, right? So, while he's getting 46% of that volume share, he that's only averaging out to like 167 carries uh, for the running back one throughout, you know, uh, Brent, Brent Brennan's uh, tenure at San Jose state. It's just since it's, they're so pass heavy. And then you add in Siobhan Cordero getting carries as well. Um, there's just not a lot of upside with Kyrie Robinson. I kind of compare him to like, just think of a Jabari small with Tennessee, right? He'll give you, you know, 13, 14, 15, maybe fantasy points, but there's just no upside there because of, of, of the, you know, lack of uh, surefire care, or he's getting surefire carries. It's just the lack of carries that he actually gets uh, during the span of a game. So um, that's, he's just high floor, low upside, Kerry Robinson, get him late in drafts, but you'll only, is a, you know, plug and play when you need him for a, for a bye week. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's, you know, I'm looking at the numbers right now from last year. Robinson had 157 carries. Cordero had 138. There wasn't another running back on the roster to have more than that. Did there? There was no other player that had more than 20 carries on that team. Robinson scored 10 rushing touchdowns. Cordero scored nine. How the how the carry distribution works out this year? But you know, let's just say Robinson gets another 20 carries this year. Does that equate to another two touchdowns? I mean. I'm not going to say he doesn't have eight to 900 yard and 12 touchdown potential, but to your point, he doesn't feel like one of those guys that are, is going to run for 150 yards and three touchdowns on a week to week basis. He may be more of the, you know, 20 care, you know, 15 to 16 carries 70 yards and a touchdown on a week to week basis. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Just, I, I think you, you know what you're going to get from yeah. him. As you said, there's really, you know, we say that there's nobody else in that backfield, but they brought in a Juco transfer. Who knows of some, some young, you know, redshirt freshman or something that could challenge for some reps too. So there's just a lot of unknowns behind Robinson um, kind of similar to the wide receiver position, which we can hit on quickly. Um, you know, we're probably 90% that Lockhart's going to be the wide receiver one, but he was, I don't, can we say bad last year? I mean, he only averaged seven and a half fancy points a game. And we've seen this offense support two wide receivers, you know, Trey Walker and Bailey Gaither from a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, he only had 51% conversion rate on his targets. He, had, he led the team in drops despite being second on the team in targets. So, um, you know, I, I, he wasn't very good last year. So um, we're still pegging him as wide receiver one, but we'll look for assurances uh, during, during fall camp that he's, you know, progressing. 
Yeah, if there's a bright spot, it's the potential of him being the wide receiver one. And he did average 16 yards a catch, which was a half yard more than Elijah Cooks did last year, who went over 1,000 yards on, on only 69 catches. So, um, you know, the potential in the system is there. Um, but to your point, I mean, you know, he had some drops. Did he get some things figured out? If he's going to be that wide receiver one, he's got to be reliable and a go-to for Chevin Cordero. So, Mike, that, that takes care of the Mountain West Conference. All oh, the teams. You're forgetting two teams. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Am I getting ahead of myself here? I, 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 know, I know it's tough. I, Hawaii's oh, far man, away from look, us. How, how, how did I not even write down Hawaii, man? Let, right, so, so let's go with UNLV first, right? Let's start there. Doug Brumfield most likely getting the start at quarterback, right? Got Vincent Davis, the transfer there. Um, after they lose Aiden Robbins to BYU, Ricky White, big play receiver coming back, wide receiver one. But what are we expecting with UNLV under a new, you know, new head coach this year, Mike? What 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 are your thoughts now with UNLV with Barry Odom coming in? He he was a defensive minded coach. They got Brennan Marion as the offensive coordinator coming in from Texas. Um, probably what you know. He was seems to be you know, he's got some one of the most sought after offensive coordinators, I think, or um, he's got, you know, some things leaning in his favor. Are we going to see, you know, that fast, more of an up tempo offense at UNLV this year? Uh, I don't know about more fast pace, but I, I do know that they're going to run the ball considerably more um, in this go go offense under under uh, Marion than they did uh, in previous years. Um, as far as how that translates to fantasy production, I think it's, it's very beneficial for, uh, quarterback Doug, Doug Brum, Brum yeah. field, um, assuming he wins the starting job, which he should, you know, he didn't have a great spring, but you know, you're learning a new system and, and all that. I think what's most appealing, even though he's like a pass first type quarterback in this offense, you're generally looking around. 14 carries per game from your the quarterback position so and that's highly valuable uh in cff so uh i like brumfield i think he benefits from the system change not so much the running backs if you look at it they'll be running 63 percent of the time which which you would think on the surface is great but they really distribute it between the quarterback and then between the um you know, the running back one, two, and three, and so forth. Uh, so it just looking back, the volume wasn't there, but very touchdown dependent um, were the running backs. So, you know, bring in Vincent Davis, maybe he hits as a, as a late round pick, but just because of how much UNLV is going to run it. Um, but I think Doug Brumfield and then maybe uh, wide receiver Ricky White are kind of the, the primary uh, assets in, in college fantasy from the Rebels. You know what happened? I was just getting lulled to sleep by all those dang one-dimensional run offenses. Now we got some up-tempo stuff, and let's let, let's finish there, man. We've got I, Hawaii. I thought you were going to say lulled to sleep by me. <laughs> <laughs> let's go to Hawaii, where we probably are even going to get them playing a little bit faster than they were a year ago, or at least that's the thought. Um, you know what? Are, are we, they're going back to the the run and shoot? I think officially. Right after last year might have been a little bit more of a hybrid type offense, um, still fast paced. But look, let's be let's let's call it. It is what it is. They just weren't very good last year. They weren't very efficient. And uh, you know, we sat there all year waiting. You know, fingers crossed on the Hawaii offense. It never did come through. Will it, what what are your thoughts on this year though? Because we still have a lot of questions at Hawaii. A ton of questions, I think. Yeah. But they're they're also so intriguing just because of we know what the run and shoot has done in prior years right with you know Nick Rolovich dating back to Washington State and then previously you know with Cole McDonald those legendary years uh those couple of years at, at Hawaii so you know we're interested if this hits you know people are getting just absolute steals with with not only Heinz and you know in the 10 to 15 round range but you know people are taking shots on some of these receivers and that's kind of what I wanted to talk with, about them with most is I, I don't think anybody has a freaking clue. I've seen four projected depth charts on Hawaii, and there's pretty much been a different trio of starters in every single depth chart. What makes this tough to predict, as you know, in the run and shoot, you typically want the slot receivers, right? 
Yep. The outside receiver can be, uh, you know, can put a can put up good numbers uh, in this style of offense. But that was that was when you have a, a Colt Brennan or a, or a Cole McDonald. We don't know that we have that with uh, Brandon Schrager. Schrager. Um, so with the question marks at quarterback, we probably want to lean with the slot receivers uh, primarily in this offense. And you're going to get, if you look back at Washington state, you look back at the two years with Rolovich at Hawaii, those inside receivers are going to average generally like 10 targets a game. Um, so that could easily translate into top 10 uh, yeah. fantasy production at the receiver. Tell me who, tell me who's the starter in the slot because Jonah Pano, Starting outside receiver, Jalen Walthall, outside receiver, Stephen McBride, the Kansas transfer, yep. outside receiver. I have no idea. I took shots on Chucky Hines, who is our projected wide receiver one now. I don't feel as confident in that pick. I got nothing to be <laughs> at this point in time in late June. I really don't have an idea of who that that primary guy is. But you know, take a shot around 28, 29, 30 of a, of a best ball and, and see if it hits. Yeah, I mean, this, look, it, it's one of those where if you're in a deep best ball draft, you, you know, as we get closer to the season, maybe we get a little bit more clarity. But at this point, you know, when you're taking those positions in deep best ball drafts where it, you got to swing for the fences, it's either going to be boom or bust. That's you, 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 that's when you start kind of aiming for names in a system, throw a dart and hope it hits, right? So Yeah, and that, just on closing with Hawaii, I think Tyler and Hines I'm starting to warm up even more to. Um, they, in the spring, because they didn't have any like concrete slot receivers, they were using Tylen Hines kind of auditioning in the slot too. don't know that he makes that move. Um, cause I think they need him as their starting yeah. running back, but man, if they, if they start flexing him out in the slot too, like, I think he's going to absolutely mash in, in a full point PPR setting. So Mike, that runs us through the mountain West. Um, Anything that we didn't get to that you want to circle back? Any want, want to put a bow on anything? Any overlying theme that you noticed as we're going through this conference that you want to kind of give a shout out to before I kind of close this thing out? I I I, I would pay money to to see a Hawaii depth chart. Just staying <laughs> on topic, I would really if there was an official depth chart out there, I would pay money to see it because we have seen. If the run and shoot hits, right? If if everything comes together, we still don't know. I think I think there's still a talent deficient roster um, on an offense, but that could be league winning type production from this, from the Hawaii receiver if it if it hits. This would be helpful when we, if one of our subscribers was actually from Hawaii and had some connections and was able to kind of put some things in our Discord. That would that would be nice. You know. We need to work on getting somebody into the discord that's out on the, on the islands. Out there. We, I, Hey, we've, we've had Australian, we've had, uh, we've had Australian subscribers. We've had people from England right. on our discord too. So, I mean, I wouldn't put it past them to, look, man, that, you know, that's so, so the point you just made is sort of the bow that I'll put on the mountain West conference. And that is when you look at some of these teams and we talked about it, you know, Wyoming with what's going on running back there, New Mexico as well with the new OC and the potential for running back there, Fresno State, Hawaii, the uncertainties we have right now with those depth charts. Um, you know, same thing even with San Jose State at wide receiver one. There are a lot of questions. This is one of those conferences where a year ago we had a hell of a lot more confidence in some of these players in the preseason with our rankings than we do now. This is going to be one of those conferences, I feel, where in more traditional formats, we're going to have to see one, two, maybe as many as three games from some of these teams and see how the depth chart kind of shakes out, see how they perform, see what kind of performance you're going to see. We say it all the time in traditional, you know, fantasy league formats, waiver wire usually wins the league for you. You can build a tremendous foundation during the draft on draft day but the waiver wire will usually uh put you over the top and the great thing about waiver wire in college fantasy football is that you can completely miss the mark in drafts and rebuild your team through the waiver wire what mountain west might be one of those conferences where we're gonna have to sit back and kind of take 
you know, take stock for a couple of two or three weeks and uh, maybe make a move on the waiver wire, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and I think that's a good segue to promote our uh, our waiver wire report that we write during the uh, in-season uh, content schedule. We have a very comprehensive waiver wire report that sits on your top priorities, kind of guys that maybe keep in mind, um, you know, that maybe if you need desperate in need of a, a, a add to your roster, those are those guys. We have a dynasty portion, um, very extensive waiver wire report and i would imagine there's going to be some mountain west uh players popping up on there in the in the 2023 season sounds good man so look let's lend and we just start ending these shows with a fun one i i just thought of one while i was uh you know trying to figure out how to wrap this thing up now our man mike bainbridge is going to be getting married uh in the not too distant future are you going to be clean shaven are you going to grow the beard out for the for the wedding uh, which way is what is it going to be uh <laughs> I well, I, I I think I look better with a beard first off, and then two, it's part in doing part because you got to hide the double and triple chins that I got under here. Um, but we're it's we're a year out from the wedding, so today marks the day that we are starting a diet. So well, you know, we'll have a beard, but maybe we'll have less chins that we could pull off. Well, cool. a lot to talk about. Look, I'm just trying to give the guys some material for the Discord. That you, you know, um, so that's all we're trying to do here. But look, man. That's going to do it for the Mountain West. This is our third show. Uh, you know, the you know, we we're going to start posting these much like we did with the Names to Know series. As soon as that wraps up, we'll start putting these podcasts and videos out on the website over the next couple of weeks, run through the July 4th holiday. And then from there, we're going to be ramping up a lot of our preseason content and get ready uh, for all the camp news that's going to be breaking in. So, look, that's going to do it for the Mountain West show, the preseason series conference series that we have here for Mike Bainbridge. My name's Joe DeSalvo. We'll see you guys at the next show when we're talking Mac until then.